Draft Mechanic is a proud member of Punchboard Media. Pull up a chair at punchboardmedia.com. Draft Mechanic, episode 85. On this episode of Draft Mechanic, we've got a Kickstarter preview of Homebrewers and discuss recent plays of Bandito and Istanbul the Dice Game. We've got a six-pack review of Most Wanted, which we're also putting on tap. We talk about the GABF 2018 results, and we asked our Slack channel what player count surprises they had experienced. So sit back, relax, grab a pint, and enjoy the show. You've seen the future, and it works today. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Draft Mechanic. I'm Jake. And I'm Danielle. And Draft Mechanic is a podcast about board games and craft beer and anything we can do to tie the two together. Here at Draft Mechanic, we like our beer like we like our board games. Perhaps with superlatives this week? Certainly this time. Yes, we've got Most Wanted, which is obviously a superlative. You might find it in a yearbook, though, not technically the way it no, was used in this particular No, that would be very, very <laughs> weird if you found it in a yearbook, and mm-hmm. no. And we are also talking about the Great American Beer Festival Awards, which we are very excited to talk about for hometown reasons that we'll get to much later on. But and hey, also because it's cool. It is also very cool. But if this is your first episode of Draft Mechanic, thank you so much for joining us. We love all of our listeners, new and returning. Turning. If you're looking for information on us on the internet, hit at draftmechanic.net or type at draftmechanic into all your favorite social media, Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. We've also got a Board Game Geek Guild that is guild number 2470. There will be a thread up for this episode and every episode. So if you're listening to us and you're like, hey, I have something to say about that, that is the place to go and share it with everyone. We also have a Board Game Geek micro badge, and I'd like to throw a quick thanks out to Eric Clemens for picking that up since the last episode. If you are a Board Game Geek user and you want to grab that micro badge, hit up the guild. we got a thread there if you need some geek gold, and also so you can go click through and click it and show off that. Draft Mechanic Love on your Board Game Geek profile. Such bling. Such bling. If you happen to be in the Charlotte, North Carolina area, we do twice monthly meetups. We do one on the first Thursday of every month. That's going to be at Good Road Cider Works. The next one coming up is actually October 4th, so I think three days after this drops. Mm -hmm. Jake's not going to be there, but I will definitely be there with a ton of games, and we will have a great time. They've got great cider and mead. They've got some non-alcoholic beverages. It is an absolutely wonderful space. We also have a meetup on the third Tuesday of every month at Salute Cerveceria. That is upstairs if you are looking for it. Mm -hmm. And uh, we love that space as well, but that one is not coming up till later in October, and I'll tell you about it on the next episode. (laughs) (laughs) In quick notes of places we were that are not physical, however, we uh, just had had a chance to go on our friend BJ's live show on Facebook Live. He does Gumbo Live. That's BJ from Board Game Gumbo. We just got to hang out with BJ for an hour, talk about some games and talk about some beers. And we also talked a little bit about how we got those meetups going and, you know, some tips for people that are looking to start meetups at breweries. So if you want to check that out, you can go visit the Facebook page. It's facebook.com slash board game gumbo. We'll put a link in the show notes as well. Okay. One fun bit of games news I wanted to mention real quick. I was poking around on Board Game Geek doing, you know, show notes and all that stuff like I usually do. And I popped into the Essen Geek Preview, and I noticed that it is officially over a thousand titles for Essen this year. Now, to be fair, that does include different language versions of stuff that was put in there multiple times, but just the fact that they have a thousand entries with th- four weeks to go until the show, that's pretty impressive, and I wouldn't be surprised to see that number get up to 12, maybe even 1,300. Hey, that means we're going to have a very exciting, like, March of next year. Yes, it's going to be when... a great time for us when those games start coming over. Yeah, I would really like to, like, I just, you know, did a quick scroll through and just all of the bigger kind of Euro games that are the kind of things that like we would really love to play, but just never makes it over here until much later. But it is kind of cool also to know that some publishers like Renegade are picking up a lot of these things quicker. Like we're going to get the Uwe Rosenberg game uh, Reichholt, which is his next big box game. That's going to be coming over pretty quick from them. And some other publishers like uh, Plan B is obviously bringing over the Eggerspiel stuff. So hopefully we'll be seeing that stuff getting over here quicker. But I know a lot of people are already looking to get all that stuff and have somebody mule it to BGGCon. We're not that lucky, but I'm really excited to play some of the stuff that's on that list. It's hard to believe Renegade's picking up things quickly. (laughs) In a way, though, it kind of looking at that list made me kind of look back at Gen Con this year. And we've had this talk over the last few months of what were the biggest, hottest things coming out of Gen Con. And for the most part, stuff that we're super excited about isn't coming out at Gen Con as much as it used to. It either comes out at Origins or it comes out at a random time, and then a lot of this stuff is obviously Essen stuff that will arrive for us in the spring. That's something I didn't really think about until this particular year. I mean, it largely has to do with the stuff we're excited about. I mean, a lot of the stuff that does come out at 
S or not not at SN at Gen Con is sort of that fantasy flight mm-hmm. dynamic and every every time we look at the fantasy flight in flight report and sort of go, Oh, well I guess that's a thing. I, I always remind you, like we're not their target market. We mm-hmm. haven't been super excited about a fantasy flight game in a couple of years now. It's just their games are suited towards a different type of gamer. And I'm I'm gonna be very excited to see what kinds of fun medium weight Euros come over from Essen in the <laughs> spring and that'll be fun. And I think it makes sense also for people to bring stuff out at Origins if they can manage it, because then you get a whole nother month or yeah. two actually that you can be marketing and getting promotion and reviews and that kind of just getting the buzz out about your game. If you can bring it out at Origins and get the same result, why would you wait until Gen Con? Yeah, I mean, that all makes perfect logical logical sense to me. I just wish we could magically fly to Essen sometimes. <laughs> well, maybe next year. Maybe someday. All right, well, moving on to uh, our Kickstarter section. You want to go through the Kickstarter updates real quick? Sure. We talked about the Artemis Project last episode, and that is coming from Grand Gamers Guild. It is currently 280% funded, with $70,000 pledged of its $25,000 goal. It is ending on October 5th, so this Friday, if you're listening to this, the week it drops. It is currently funded at 10 stretch goals, including a fifth player and a rule set for solo play. So mm-hmm. a fifth player and a first player. Yeah. The second one I want to follow up on is the Jasper Board Gaming Table from BoardGameTables.com that is 1,400% funded, which is significantly more than the 280 <laughs> even. Um, we have 990 backers and it is $700,000 of the $50,000 goal. This is ending on October 12th, so not the Friday after this episode drops, but the following Friday. And currently, the delivery estimate, if you jump on the Kickstarter campaign, is April of 2019. They had been sort of updating the delivery estimate as they got more and more pledges to account for the fact that they'd have to make more of these things. So if you started to back now, you would probably be getting it late spring, let's be honest, early summer of mm-hmm. next year. I was really surprised. The estimates chart that they had said up to, I think, about 1,200 they expect to deliver in April. So it's, it sounds like they've learned a lot from doing the Duchess and the way that the timeline rolled out on that one. So I'm really hoping that they're able to keep up with that timeline this time around. I Like we said in the last episode, we've had a chance to play on the Duchess, which is their previous game table a good bit, and it's a pretty darn solid gaming table. Well, I mean, you'll get it when you get it. I mean, they can't send it if they haven't had it made, and it's sounds like they have either a plan in place or some of them already going into production. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't be surprised. But you don't hold hard and fast to these shipping dates. I know the last round of them were slightly delayed. I use the word slightly to be generous. <laughs> well, hopefully they have learned from it so people can get their board gaming tables a little bit sooner. Let's talk about some new projects. Though. Okay, first up, I've got Project L, and this is coming from Board Cubator, currently funding at 384% of its goal. That's 67 k of $17,000. This ends on Thursday, October 18th, with an estimated delivery of October 2019. You can back this and get the base game for 41 bucks or the Master Edition, for 57 bucks. Uh, this is in euros and translated, obviously, to dollars, so I can say the numbers with some confidence. The Master Edition kind of has more content in a fancy box. It's kind of like this two-level pledge thing we're seeing a lot with Kickstarters these days. So Project L is an abstract tile puzzle game where you are filling out polyomino shapes to get more pieces and fill in bigger puzzles. The production is definitely something that's going to be catching a lot of eyes on this one. It's very minimalist and clean design, but you have these t- um, these kind of card tiles that have insets for different polyomino shapes. And yeah, you're they're going- double-air yeah. tiles. And you're going to be collecting these little acrylic pieces of polyominoes of one th- through five blocks and using those to fill in the shapes on that particular puzzle. And then once you finish that puzzle, you get a new piece, depending on what card it is you're filling out, and you're using that to obviously generate more pieces, so on and so forth. There's also an interesting kind of mechanic where you can have up to four puzzles going at the same time for yourself, and you have the option to take this master action, which allows you to add a piece to every puzzle all at the same time if you have a piece that will fit every puzzle. And they show it, obviously, you know, using this to complete four puzzles at the same time, and you feel great, and there's explosions going off, and so on and so forth. But the production of the game looks really sharp, and they definitely blinged it out, I guess is what you want to say. It's very... I don't want to say that. You, you want to say well, that. What do you think? What do you think? No, I mean, you're right. It is It is certainly well produced. It is not flashy. It is really clean looking. The tiles, I think, are dark top layer mm-hmm. and light bottom layer. So they're very easy to see the shapes that you're making. 
the pieces aren't embellished in any way. They're just colored pieces that you're putting in. It looks really clean, but you can tell it's well done. Like I said, they're double layer player boards, yeah. which is that both versions come with the double layer player boards? Yeah, apparently the Master Edition comes with like pieces that are five spaces instead ah. of just up to four. And there's some additional like power tiles and you get like this ghost mini expansion. And it's like, this is the other thing that I kind of wanted to talk about here is I kind of like getting really frustrated with these kind of the two level Kickstarter thing where they have you can have the game or you can have the game you actually want for you know they they get your foot in the door and be like yeah you totally want this game at oh, what 41 bucks I said but you could get the really good one for 57 yeah I mean there's something to be said for allowing more people to get in on the Kickstarter if it's a really great game mm -hmm. and the actual first level pledge is a good game it's not just a good game with a bunch of stuff stripped out of it, yeah. then I think it's good to have a lower level pledge because not everybody can throw that $57 in there. Or maybe um, you go in on that $41 level pledge to make sure that you are in on the campaign mm -hmm. and you look at it a little more and you get to the end of the campaign and you're like, okay, I have it in my budget. I can throw that extra $16 on there, which I mean, if you've already pledged 41, 16 doesn't sound like a ton, but it, mm -hmm. I mean, it adds up that kind of thing especially if you're backing a bunch of projects. So you can pick and choose what you'd like to get the more fancy version of, mm -hmm. but still have given them the money towards reaching their pledge goal. Because yeah. I know a lot of times when we talk to friends of ours who run Kickstarters for various different companies, they have a lot of issue with people fluctuating in and out of pledging for their product. Whereas like, if you've got two layers, maybe you pledge at the lower level first, and then you decide you want to upgrade it, you can upgrade it. And it's not so much of a fluctuation on the campaign. Okay. Yeah, I can definitely see that from the the publisher standpoint. I don't know. Like you said in the middle there, at the end of the campaign, you might decide to up your pledge and 16 bucks isn't a whole lot. I feel like that is kind of what they're going for here. They are hoping that people do just say, oh, it's just 16 bucks. I can totally swing that now. While looking at this, 57 bucks may or may not be, you know, the the value you think you want to get out of this game. Okay, question for you. Yeah. Would you rather have this kind of two-level pledge system where you can pledge 41 and get a game or pledge 57 and get everything they've done for the mm -hmm. game? Or would you rather have it be a $41 pledge and then have them have a bunch of stuff you can add on at the end in a pledge manager? Hmm. I, mean, I absolutely hate pledge managers. Yeah, the, the pledge manager is a very similar thing where you're just kind of like nickel and diming them after they get that pledge. And this is how Simon has operated for the last five years. You know, you can just go they're look at... They're not the only offender, but they are certainly one of the bigger they're ones. They're definitely the most egregious offender if you look at like Rising Sun and Zombicide and Arcadia Quest. I try not to. Yes. Well, that's why they're on the back of the shelf. But no, like, like what you were saying, I don't think that I would prefer one more than the other. I honestly kind of wonder if I would prefer to have... Or if I prefer this or if I prefer... Uh, a game and then an expansion in a year for 20 bucks. Like if this game was 40 bucks and then had a 15 to $20 expansion to add in the more stuff, would that feel different? Yeah, but think about the shipping that they'd have to deal with. Oh, yeah, shipping. Like you have to ship a second product at that point. Right. I also think that it's sort of a combat to stretch goals as well. Mm -hmm. Because if you have a bunch of this stuff in a higher pledge level, then you're not going, well, we'll add it if we get this extra money. It'd be like, People are interested. They're giving us the extra money up front, hmm. and those people will get the extra stuff. If you can manage to get your economics down to the point where you know you can produce it for the people who want it, mm -hmm. then you don't have to worry about, well, am I going to need to make that fifth player token? Am I going to need to make that pig meeple? You know, you know what people want, and you can produce okay. it for them. That all makes a lot of sense. I don't know. I feel like we strayed a lot further away from the game than I expected, but it's an important question that I'm glad we had a chance to talk about. But overall, I think the game looks clean. It looks fun. It looks sharp. I don't think it's $57 worth of game, but if you take a look at it and that kind of abstract thing is $41 worth of game, maybe it is something that's interesting to you. We'll have to see. Yeah, that is Project L. Our second Kickstarter that we wanted to talk about is something called Something is Wrong Here. And this is an RPG coming from Kira McGran. This is funding at $17,000 of its $1,200 goal, so it is well-funded, and it is ending on Thursday, October 4th. So this is another one you're going to have to get in on quick if you'd like to get it, but I wanted to mention it because it seems like it would work really well for the holiday coming up at the end of this month. Ooh. Obviously, it is a spooky RPG Ooh, because it is based on the work of David Lynch. So if you've seen Mulholland Drive or Blue Velvet or the new Twin Peaks, that kind of sort of surreal, but also really uncomfortable human interaction. 
This is estimated delivery of October 2018 if you don't get the deck of cards that is available for it. And I think they have a, that as a print and play if you do back it at the October delivery mm. level. Or November 2018 if you back it and they actually have to send you a deck of cards. Mm -hmm. But obviously it's a PDF for the rest of it, so she can deliver it as soon as the campaign ends. This is $12 to back for the PDF or $20 to back for the PDF and those cards that I was mentioning earlier. And if you are interested in that kind of theme, a really emotion-driven RPG, this is something I figure it, it would be interesting for our listeners to check out. Yeah. The video is very weird. I don't understand what she's doing with her hands at the beginning of it, if you watch this video. <laughs> but it, it is certainly an interesting RPG, and I like to highlight those every once in a while, especially if we're talking about 12 bucks. That's That's something, if you're going to have... A Halloween gathering, or mm -hmm. if you're just really into that spooky kind of atmosphere, this might be something you're interested in. And I think it is unique, for sure. Cool. Yeah, it is definitely holiday timing appropriate. And that is Something is Wrong Here. All right, well, that's two out of three of our Kickstarters, but our next one's going to take place after the break, because we've got a full Kickstarter preview of Homebrewers. Want to wear your draft mechanic pride to your local brewery, board game meetup, or board game meetup at a brewery? Check out redbubble.com slash people slash draft mechanic for t-shirts. So like you had mentioned just before the break, we have a Kickstarter preview of Homebrewers, which is going to be a 2019 release from Dice Hate Me and Greater Than Games. This is a two to five player game, which plays in 45 to 60 minutes. It is designed by Ben Rossett and Matthew O'Malley, and the artists are Saray Henderson and Adam Ribataro. This is a game of dice action selection, beer brewing, and teaching you to sanitize your equipment because it's very, very important. <laughs> it is on Kickstarter right now. It is going through October 5th, which is this Friday, if you're listening to this when it drops. They're currently 81% funded with $23,000 of their $29,000 goal, with estimated delivery in December of 2019. This is $35 to back the base game. And you can add brew crafters at a super awesome discount of only $40 instead of $60. So you're talking about $75 there instead of $95 mm -hmm. to get both of those games. Mm -hmm. And brew crafters is definitely a very cool game. It is a much heavier game than home brewers, which we're about to tell you about. I actually also just remembered, I forgot to put this in the show notes, but they're also offering micro brewers, which is a re kind of re theme of the brew crafters travel card game. Oh. As part of this Kickstarter as well. So you can get uh, homebrewers plus microbrewers for 40 bucks, and then get the package with brew crafters as well for 80 bucks. So if you've wanted games about beer of every possible different weight, that $80 package has got to be like one of the best values I've ever seen. We're big fans of the other two. Well, honestly, to kind of tip my hand here, I'm a big fan of all three of these games. But I hey. figure, yeah, we'll save that for the end of this segment. I don't want to spoil that a fact that I really enjoy homebrewers. <laughs> all right. So. Homebrewers is a dice action selection game where you and all of the players are homebrewers that are competing for excellence and notoriety in your local homebrew club. Over the eight months of the game, you're going to be brewing beers and adjusting your reputation up the four different tracks of the four different kinds of beers, and twice during the year, halfway and then at the end of these eight months, you're going to be going to competitions. You have a Summerfest and an Oktoberfest, in which you will be earning points depending on your placement on each of those four different beer-type reputation tracks, and then also at Oktoberfest, you're going to earn additional points based on some judges that have been visible for the entire game that are going to judge your different beers based on what kind of ingredients they have in them. At the start of your turn, you're going to roll three dice that are going to determine the actions you have, but you also have the opportunity to trade dice with other players. Everybody's going to have also some special powers that affect the way that they either work with the dice or take actions, but I'll leave you to the Kickstarter page to discover that. Once you've traded your dice and you're satisfied with what you've got or begrudgingly accepted it, you're going to take actions depending on what you've got. You have options to sanitize your equipment or add an ingredient to one of your four different brew kettles. You can also get flavor cards and take flavor card actions. And of course, you can brew beer. Everybody likes to brew beer in this game because you are home brewers. That's kind of your whole deal. Mm. To brew a beer, you've got to first have an ingredient in that particular brew kettle. There's four different kinds of beers that you can brew. You can brew an IPA, a porter, a stout, or just a standard classic ale. And you're going to put an ingredient in there and then hopefully also get some flavor cards in there as well. The cards are going to stack up on top of your player board. And in addition to having thematic fun flavors, you are also going to get some special uh, kind of like boosts off of those whenever you brew a beer of that type. So, for example, if I've got a porter and it's got chocolate and vanilla in there, first of all, good job because it sounds tasty. But maybe one of them will give me an extra boost on that particular flavor track. And maybe another one will give me $2 whenever I brew with that beer because it's super popular and somebody wanted to buy a bottle of it. 
entirely possible. But every time you brew a beer, you're going to take one of the little ingredient tokens that I told you you need, you flip it over, and you put it on your sanitation track. The sanitation track is going to fill up, obviously, as you go through the game, unless you clean it, because sanitation is very important to good beer. Very. Depending on how clean your equipment is, whenever you brew a beer, you're going to brew at the top sanitation level, and it's going to move you up a certain number of spaces on that reputation track. And if you don't clean out your equipment, you're going to dwindle down on that track, and you're not going to be able to brew good beer, because again, sanitation is very important. The meat of the game is definitely in those reputation tracks that I talked about, one for each of the four different types of beer, because first you want to be up as high as possible for when one of the beer fests rolls around. You need to be able to get the most points by being at the top of that track. But also, as you cross certain points on the track that are also randomized during setup, you'll get extra bonuses. Maybe you get an extra, you know, two bucks, maybe you get an extra point, or you get uh, an ingredient or a flavor card action, those kind of things. So you're kind of constantly be looking at where you are on each of the tracks and deciding what you want to brew at the right time to get those bonuses. If you do get one of your beers all the way up to the top of that particular reputation track, you lock it in, meaning that you're the only person that can be winning that particular track, which is great for endgame scoring, and also because then nobody's able to challenge your mastery of vanilla chocolate cinnamon porters. Mm. Each month, you also have a variable action that's the calendar action. It's going to be different thematic things that you can do. Maybe you're brewing for a friend's wedding and you're able to do an extra brew action if you have a calendar die. All of those actions also have an option for you to spend two extra dollars to take a kind of a double power action, maybe like double sanitize or double brew or something like that. Those are really cool actions and you want to be aware of them. At the end of the game at the Oktoberfest, you're going to earn points based on your standing on the different reputation tracks for the four kinds of beers. And then you're going to judge the different judges that will come out. And these will want specific types of flavors in different kinds of, or different beers, or maybe you want to have a whole bunch of flavor in such and such beer. But at the very end, there's also a scoring opportunity where you score double the amount of points of whatever your lowest reputation track is. So if you've kind of been neglecting your IPA the whole game and you only are up on the second point there, you're only going to score four points. But if you balanced out really well and you were able to kind of get everything up in that seven, eight points, then you're going to definitely get another seven or another 14 or so points at the end of the game. And that's big points for this. Mm hmm. I mean, this is a game where we're talking about like 50 or 60 points mm -hmm. for the game, I think. So balance, another thing that's very important when you're brewing. Unless you're a crazy home brewer that's brewing the Sour Sherry Cinnamon Chocolate Jasmine Kimchi IPA. Not that anybody in this room brewed that beer last time they played this game. <laughs> and at the end of the game, whoever has the most points, unsurprisingly, is the champion home brewer and the winner of the game. Obviously. Yes. Danielle, thoughts on homebrewers? Homebrewers is interesting. I really like the fact that there are definitely certain points where randomness is going to play a factor, but there are enough ways to mitigate all of that randomness that you don't feel like you're out of control when you're playing the game. Like when you say to somebody, this is a dice allocation game, my first thought is, well, if I roll badly, then I'm just going to lose the game. Mm -hmm. Or if I don't roll the things that work together, I'm not going to be able to do anything. And I'm going to kind of lock up and just end up with really clean equipment and no ingredients. <laughs> But there's enough opportunity to mitigate this. Like you had mentioned, there is a trading phase where everybody rolls their dice and then you can trade between players. But there's also the opportunity at any point on your turn, you can pay a dollar to change one of your dice to any other of the faces of the die. So as long as you have a dollar, you're never locked into something that's really absolutely useless to you. Mm -hmm. That also helps if nobody rolled the thing that you wanted, so you can't get it in the trading phase, mm -hmm. because if nobody rolls a brew for the whole round, you can't trade for one, you're going to have to spend a dollar to change something else into brewing. You do also have the option to spend $3 to take an additional action at any point during your turn, which I think is a really nice way to mitigate that. Again, if you've earned a whole lot of money and you've got nothing else to do with it, you can always spend that money to get another ingredient or sanitize an equipment real quick. It also means that you never feel really burdened by the fact that you can get off cycle with other players yeah like in a lot of games where you're talking about specific rounds and being judged at specific points if you are out of sync with the way that the scoring is going to work you could get to the summer fest and be halfway through producing something and not be able to actually get it out or be one action away from getting a beer out to really boost yourself up to get a whole bunch of points. But because you can spend those $3 to get an extra action on each of your turns, you have a little bit more control over where you are in the cycle of your brewing so that you don't get caught off guard by the judging. Homebrewers also, I think, makes a really great use of earning bonuses off of tracks that you're already advancing on. This is something that I've been really enjoying and talking a lot about recently. Like I talk about it whenever I talk about Ganshan Clever and how 
I wanted something more with that particular mechanism. I bet you never thought this would come back to haunt you, but I figured it out. Anyway. You wanted so, to play a completely different game? I wanted to, yeah, I wanted to play a completely different game, but I wanted to be able to earn bonuses off of tracks that I'm working on and make that, you know, part of a whole rather than the entire. And I really love the way that it uses that particular mechanism as I'm advancing up these four tracks. I'm getting bonuses at certain times, depending on the way that those tiles lay out. But I would very frequently have a turn that I'm setting myself up for. And I'm like, I don't want to advance on this track yet because I want to be able to advance three steps instead of two steps when I brew this beer. So I need to get another flavor card in because when I get three steps, I'm going to get another card here. Then that will allow me to do this and then I can do blah, blah, blah. I like the cascading effect of earning things off of tracks. Then this uh, and Homebrewers does an awesome job rewarding me for that. There's also the potential when you put different flavors into your beer, there are a lot of flavors that allow you to increase your reputation on the adjoining tracks. So Mm -hmm. the way they're set up, I think it's ale, porter, stout, IPA. So if you brew a stout and you put specific ingredients, you may be able to increase your rating on either porter or IPA when you brew that because of the benefit of that ingredient up to level six, because at that point you're more than halfway up the track and it's like, okay, you need to brew that beer if you'd like to actually improve upon it. But you're not feeling like you need to focus on everything, but there's no way to do it because if you create a really strong combination of flavors in the beer that you are brewing, you are able to get benefits on the other tracks as well. So let's talk about strong flavors for a second since you brought it up. Like I made a joke about earlier, the Sour Cherry Kimchi Chocolate Cinnamon Vanilla IPA was an actual beer that I was technically brewing in this game, which sounds absolutely horrendous. It does. I mean, maybe take like two ingredients out of that and I would drink it. But it's... I guess it's interesting to talk about the fact that you don't need to brew a beer that sounds like it would taste good to do well in the game, particularly. Yeah, that was a little bit of a thematic issue for me. Like, you could stick whatever was the most beneficial ingredient for you from a gameplay standard into whatever beer you wanted. And there was really no downside to doing so, other than the fact that you then had to say, I had to brew the <laughs> kimchi lavender Sour IPA. Cherry. Yeah. But... It also sort of did tie back in because you knew what the judges were going to be looking for at the end of the game. And if there was a judge who's like, no, I need five sweet ingredients in the same beer. (laughs) Like you could be like, okay, I just stick all these sweet ingredients in this beer because that's what the judge wants. But a lot of times you were making these weird combinations just to get a better stack of benefits, not necessarily to go towards what the judges wanted. So that was a little bit of a thematic disconnect for me. But that being said... Just yesterday, we were at a beer tasting event that had some stouts that had (laughs) a ton of ingredients, and maybe two or three of them didn't necessarily make sense or come through, but you know, (laughs) people make all kinds of weird stuff, particularly Mm homebrewers, but that was a point where I was like, hmm really going to brew that? Are you going to spend your time and money brewing that? (laughs) Yes, well, we do specifically have one brewery in uh, the north side of Charlotte here that does some really weird adjective beer. Yeah, they, hey, they he do. He started as a home brewer. So, I mean, a lot of, yeah. But it, it is kind of funny, and it does create some really great stories. And you talk about it, and you talk about, oh, I'd never actually drink this beer. You post that picture on Twitter, and like two or three people are just like, actually, I do want to try that now that I think about that. That sounds like the kind of thing I want to give one shot. Well, so, I mean, I think we were talking about that with BJ the other yeah. day. He had somebody who had a like a wheat beer that had some kind of jalapenos in it because it was a nacho flavor. Mm-hmm. And the, the person who brewed it actually wasn't terribly fond of it, but a couple of his buddies were super <laughs> fond of it. I'm like, I want that thing. That sounds absolutely delicious. And I think from a thematic standpoint, it makes more sense to be able to do that in a homebrewer game yeah. than if they had tried to make that an expansion to something like Brew Crafters, where you're making like these crazy beers in a production facility where that's not necessarily ever going to happen. Like, People who need to make money off of this are probably going to make things that actually taste good. Whereas homebrewers, they can spend a couple of bucks to buy whatever ingredient they want and throw it in the beer. And if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. And you try it again. But yeah, it makes more sense as a homebrew game, but it was still kind of (laughs) weird. So all in all, I really enjoyed Homebrewers. It's a game that I'm excited to add to my collection when the Kickstarter fulfills. I really enjoy the way that you get to play with that kind of track synergy and you're brewing some really wacky beers that you're probably only ever going to see in a homebrew competition. I, you know, I would assume that a good portion of our listeners are probably beer fans. And for 35 bucks, and if you're a beer fan and you want to have a nice hour-long game, I super recommend Homebrewers. It's the kind of game that's really kind of perfectly fit for people like me. I feel like in 
the last maybe year or two, we've seen a lot of euros that have been turned into thus and such the dice game. In fact, we're going to be talking about one of them a little later in this episode. And Homebrewers isn't Brewcrafters the dice game, but I feel like the thematic and mechanical shift works a lot like that. Brewcrafters is a nice medium weight euro where you are working on making a functioning production brewery. Homebrewers allows you a little bit more freedom. You never feel quite as stretched thin as you can when you're playing a medium euro. You've got that sort of flying by the seat of your pants, the dice driven mechanic, but there's enough control like you would have if you were a skilled homebrewer, if you were somebody who did this as a hobby. I like the way that this game takes the theme and gives it a much more suitable mechanic for the dice-based version of a Dice Hate Me beer game. They've got a whole bunch of them at this point, and I think if they were going to make a dice-based game that wasn't, you know, super light like a lot of some of these dice games can be, they've done it very well. Cool. Well, you got to the end of the day on Friday to go back Homebrewers on Kickstarter. I personally encourage you to go check it out. I think it's a great game at a great price. I would love to see this one made. Yes. Okay, up next we have Bandito. This is a 2016 release from Helvetique, one to four players, 10 to 15 minutes, designed by Martin Nedergaard Anderson, with art by Lucas Guidetti Perez. This is a route-closing, tile-laying, and bandit-trapping card game. And we got this one as a review copy from Helvetique. In Bandito... You start with a card which has the bandit on it, and it has several routes that are coming off of the edges of the initial card. Each player is going to start with three additional route cards that they're going to draw into their hand, and they're going to take turns placing one of the route cards from their hand attached to the open trails which are starting on the bandit card. The bandit has either five or six trails from his initial card, depending on whether you're playing easy or normal mode. When you play a card, all of the trails have to connect to existing trails if they connect to anything, and you can never run a trail just into a dirt wall. Mm -hmm. You are going to attempt to connect all of the trails to the dead ends where there are people searching for the bandit in the tunnels. So there are little pictures of a flashlight that is a blocked off piece of trail, and you're trying to get all of the open paths that have been laid out by other cards so far to end in those searchlights. And if you do, before you run out of cards, then you have caught the bandit because he cannot escape through his trails. And you are the winner because that was the object of the game. You are all the winner. All of you, yes. It is a cooperative game. Except the bandit. He does not win. He does not win. (laughs) Yeah, there's a nice little small box game that you'll get done in that advertised 15 minutes pretty easily. Oh, yeah. Um, You know, it's nice. Uh, They're kind of plasticky almost cards, which makes me pretty comfortable taking this out to a pub setting kind of deal. I feel like I could probably do this on a table without getting concerned about it getting like wet or something or just, you know, from whatever table residue. But it does take up a surprising amount of table space as you get going, because if you don't head off the bandit really quickly, you're going to be expanding out your cards pretty darn far and we got to one point where you know it was probably two and a half to three feet long in one direction and just the way that the cards particularly grew that round yeah in the rules of defense they do say place the bandit card in the middle of a large (laughs) table and at first i was like oh it's just this comes in one of those little oink size boxes so Mm -hmm. if you've ever bought anything from oink games that size of a box and you're like oh I don't need that much space, but Mm -hmm. as it got going, we definitely at one point had to shift one of our games down our dining table so that we had enough room to be able to play it out. So maybe this is not one of those round pub top tables, but Mm -hmm. if you have like a good long table, if you've got maybe a picnic table or whatever, this would work fine on it. And as for the gameplay, you're not going to get a ton of super strategic depth out of this. It, you know, you have to obviously think about where these paths are going to go and what kind of puzzle pieces have we seen in the past that were likely to close this off. But I could easily be popping this out at a pub meetup so we could have a, you know, a quick little 15 minute thing as people are coming in. I think that's really a good spot for it. Yeah, there wasn't a whole lot of strategic planning, but I did really feel that I was thinking about the cards I had in my hand and where I could play them to make sure that I wasn't really creating paths that we couldn't close because Mm -hmm. you can never run a path into an area that just has dirt on it. So if you ever get stuck in a spot, you may be trying to draw a bunch of times to get a card that fits into a specific spot. And that may burn through a bunch of the good cards that you want to have because whenever you can't place a card at all, Mm-hmm. Not just you don't want to because it opens up a bunch more, but if you can't place a card at all, you take your hand and you discard it underneath the draw pile. So it doesn't actually shorten your game, but you draw a full new hand. And maybe you have two of those flashlight ending cards in your hand, 
but they don't close off the things that you want to close off currently. You've built the route poorly. You don't want to discard those all the way down to the end because then maybe you could close off a couple of things before you draw more cards that force you to have more branching paths. But if you can't place it, you have to discard that whole hand. <laughs> yeah, we did have that happen near the end of one of our games. We had one specific card that we needed to either close it out or make it the next you know section that would come out. And we drew had to draw up, draw up, I think, three or four hands to finally get a card that would fit there. And thankfully, it was a card that fit there and also closed everything off. But the thing I was most surprised about with this is some of the games we were playing, there was a point where we thought we had it managed and we had it down to one entrance. And then just because of the cards we had in our hand, it had to open back up to two and then very quickly open back up to four five or six open entrances. It is deceptively easy for this game to get unmanaged in a way as you're building out the particular bandit path. That being said, we also had some games where we drew just the right cards <laughs> that we put down, I think, it was four. five or... Was yeah. it four? Mm -hmm. We put down four cards and the game just ended. We were done. But it's so simple to set up. Literally, you take the cards, you shuffle the cards, you, you take the so. piece of cardboard or the super card, super as they call card. it. You put it in the middle. It's so easy to just pull all the cards back together, shuffle them up, deal them out again, and go again if you get an easy close off like that. Plus, then you get that cool little feeling of, hey, we won the game real quick. Yeah. Yeah, Bandito, it's a fun little pocket game, and I think it's, you know, the kind of thing that if you happen upon a copy for a few bucks, it's worth throwing in your game bag if you are likely to be able to go buy game nights and you want to have a quick filler like that. I can't give this a 100% glowing review, though, because mm -hmm. I do have a thematic problem with it. This is a game designed by a Swiss company with a Swiss designer and a Swiss artist, and it's produced in Poland. There are five languages that are spoken in Switzerland and Poland, None of them has bandito as the word for bandit, but it is in Spanish, and just thematically, it feels like they could have made a better choice with what they called the game, just taking into account stereotypes that exist in the world. I don't understand why the bandit is Spanish. Maybe he's Portuguese, because bandito is also Portuguese for bandit. But I'm willing to bet more people recognize that as Spanish than as Portuguese. Yeah, I don't super love it either. Uh, uh, I do want to say, yeah. like, from an art perspective, the bandit is invisible. You mm -hmm. you see his clothing, but he doesn't actually have a physical form about him. You don't see any of his skin or face or anything like that. But I, I just, I don't like that particular thematic choice. Yeah. The game is fun. That choice is a little worrisome. Yeah, so check it out if you are interested in that. It is available on Amazon, from what I understand, and you can get it at your local game stores as well. Yeah, we got it from Toysmith, who is the U.S. distributor for Helvetique. I know you can get it from Helvetique's website, you can oh. get it off Amazon, you can get it a whole bunch of places. Cool. Next up, we are talking about Istanbul the Dice Game. This is a 2017 release from AEG. It plays two to four players in 20 to 40 minutes. The designer is Rudiger Dorn, and the artist is Andreas Resch. And this is a game of dice action selection and a bizarre battle for rubies. That is bizarre with an A, not bizarre with an I, as we talked about in our Carcassonne episode <laughs> last episode. I also do want to mention that we got this as a review copy from AEG at Gen Con. So, Istanbul, the dice game, is unsurprisingly a dice game. And it's going to be kind of more your standard dice game where you're going to roll a fistful of dice at the beginning of your turn, and you're going to decide what particular actions you're going to take with those dice, and then you pass it on to the next player, they roll the dice, do the same thing, so on and so forth, going around. On your turn, when you roll your dice, you'll start with five dice at the beginning of the game, and the dice have the four different types of goods. You have red, blue, green, and yellow. There's also a side that will give you two coins, and there's another side that will allow you to flip over and activate one of the bizarre cards. So you roll all your dice, and at the beginning of the game, you'll have two actions to choose, and you can choose to spend your dice in those two actions however you want. If you have dice of the same symbol of either coin or card, you can spend those dice together. So for example, if I had two card dice, I could use those two dice and flip over two bizarre cards and choose one to activate. I'll talk about those later on. Same with the coins. You can take two coins per coin die you have, and you take them all as one action. And then of the goods dice, you're going to kind of combine them in interesting ways to either get you a tile that is a free die face of that particular one that you can save for a later turn, or maybe you can buy reroll tokens, or you can get a wild token of any good, so on and so forth. Better combinations of goods are going to get you better rewards as well. For example, on the main central board, you'll have one section for each of the four different kinds of goods that if you spend four or later in the game, five or six of a die face, you get one of the rubies, which is your primary goal in this game to get six rubies. There's also a set of market tiles that you can purchase for generally three of a kind to get some of these actions 
Since there's one also that is one of each of the four different goods that will award you an additional die for a later or for later rounds, you'll always get to have one additional die roll on your particular turn once you buy that tile. You can also use big sets of goods to purchase rubies off of a general market track on the board there that you need one of everything plus one and then two, then three, then four additional goods to get the rubies off of that track. There's another track that for an action you can spend an amount of money to buy a ruby off of this particular track. The last section you can get rubies from is once you have five of those action tiles in your personal tableau, you'll get one of those rubies kind of immediately. It's the only one you don't have to spend an action to take the ruby for. And pretty much you're going to continue going around until somebody hits six rubies, and then you're going to finish out that round. And whoever has the most rubies at the end of the game will win. If you tie, then it goes to money and you sell your tiles and your reroll tokens for money as well. You'll notice I didn't talk a whole lot about it, any kind of like thematic kind of feel in this game. And that's really because... The theme isn't super necessary in Istanbul, the dice game. Sure, there's goods and they have, you know, this one has a picture of rice or this one has a picture of fabrics, so on and so forth. But if you removed all of that from this, the game would still function perfectly fine. And frankly, I'm fine with that. Mechanically, I felt it very satisfying. It's very much a the dice game kind of thing where you roll a bunch of dice on your turns and you use them in interesting combinations to either build an engine or get end game points. And that's kind of what a lot of dice games do. Well, I mean, a lot of the things that made Istanbul, the original game, feel a little bit thematic was the fact that you were moving around on a grid mm -hmm. and you were dropping off your assistants and they were doing the actions at the place you left them. You had only so much room in the cart that you were moving around in to collect goods. And then you had to go back and get those assistants or have them meet you at a central meeting spot in order to start dropping them off again and create another path. They've removed the entire path system from this when they made it a dice game, mm -hmm. because that's what makes it a dice game. It's not a board game, it's a dice game. So that thematic tie was sort of lost in it, and that was the strongest thematic tie. That's not to say that they did not try to make this Istanbul the dice game. I mean, like you said, there are jewelry, which is blue, and green, which is rice, mm -hmm. and red, which is fabric, and yellow, which is fruit. And I remember that those are what those four things are. And then there is a wild card, which is a closed crate, which could be anything. But it could very well be, you know, any any other four goods. It could be paper, which is blue, and, yeah. you know, anything else like that. But they did put the Istanbul theme in here. It's just not important because the thing that was taken out was what made it feel thematic in the base game. Yeah, I mean, I feel like the theme and the name are only there just to make people buy it that bought the original game. And which is frustrating because like like I said, as a dice game and for that, you know, 30-ish minute time, I think this is very uh, rewarding. It feels good. You know, you get a good kind of feel for the way your engine builds as you go through the game. It's a good, solid dice game. It's not my favorite dice game in the world. I mean, it's not even my favorite game with dice that we've talked about on this episode, but it is a very solid mechanically dice game. I will agree. It is not my favorite dice game that we talked about on this episode as well. And I think this game and Homebrewers actually fit the same spot in somebody's collection. If you're looking for a 30 to 45 minute dice game that plays generally three or four players. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could play it with fewer. I think you can play both of them with two as well. Mm -hmm. But if that plays a couple of players and doesn't play like eight people, you like something like Las Vegas, which is also from Rudiger Dorn, would yeah. do. They both meet that same f spot in a collection. But I would much rather play Homebrewers. I don't know if it is because I have more thematic connection to homebrewing beer as opposed to being a merchant in Istanbul that's trying to get rubies. I've never been a merchant in Istanbul trying to get rubies. Usually you're out for sapphires. Mm, yeah, that's me. Um, <laughs> but I don't know. I just, I would rather play that game. That being said, this game already exists and is available for purchase. Homebrewers, if it funds, will be available in December of next year. So if you'd like a dice game that is 30 minutes long and easy to teach and will get you through the next year and a half, Istanbul the Dice Game is a fine game. Yeah, it's, it's funny that the way that you kind of equated those two games, because... I think that you approach games, comparing games from a, a, the, like, how will this game play and what kind of time frame thing, where I look at it as more of a mechanical thing, in which I would say that this and Homebrewers couldn't really be more different in terms of dice games. You know, with Homebrewers, you've got the dice action selection. With Istanbul, the dice game, you've got the, I'm going to roll some dice and do some stuff with it, and it doesn't really impact anybody else kind of solitaire. And both games are perfectly legitimate for those things. And like we keep, you know, coming back around to, Istanbul, the dice game, does the dice game 
pretty darn well. I definitely enjoyed the way as I'm playing this game, I'm building my engine. I'm buying those market tiles or bizarre tiles. I don't really actually remember if the tiles or the cards are the bizarre part, but one of them, the one that I get to buy, I really enjoy the synergy of the way those works. There's ones that will give you an extra die. There's ones that will give you uh, income at the beginning of every, every turn. Maybe you'll get three bucks or you'll always get a free uh, re-roll token, or you'll always get to activate one of those cards that do some fun stuff. And I just really like the way that my powers increase, like my the actions and things that I can do on my turn really increase as I'm going further and further in a game of Istanbul the Dice Game. The cards as well that we talked about, I thought it was a really interesting decision to make it that you flip, you know, however many of those dice you have with a card on them, you will flip that many cards and choose one. I really like that because some of those cards not only give you a benefit, but give the other players at the table either an opportunity to get or sell something at a reduced price, or just an outright goods, which is a big, big power. And as you get later in the game, and you have more dice to roll because you've purchased more pieces in the beginning, you're going to be able to roll more, and maybe you take three cards and choose one, and you get the one that's exactly what you want. And I really enjoyed the curve of the way that the game escalates as you go on. Okay, but you need to luck into mitigation twice in that. Mm -hmm. You need to be able to roll whatever combination you need to get those additional dice to be able to roll more dice, which in a higher player count game, if you're playing with three or four people, it may be that on my turn, the tiles which are out don't include an extra die. They're all re-roll tokens, and if you get money, you get an extra pineapple. Mm -hmm. And then you buy one, and then there's an extra die, then maybe Daniel's playing with us as well. He buys that extra die, it comes back to my turn, and we're back to, you know, pineapples and re-roll tokens. <laughs> you need to be able to not only roll the combination that gives you the ability to buy a token, but that token has to be, or not token, but a tile, but that tile has to be out. Mm -hmm. And then you need to roll cards, and even if you've got re-roll tokens, it's just giving you more randomness. So if you roll a bunch of cards all at once, you then get to look at a bunch of random cards, and maybe hopefully one of them is good for you. I feel like the mitigation in this is a lot more luck-based than it is in Homebrewers. We were talking about how you can pay a dollar in Homebrewers to make a die anything you want. Yeah. There is nothing as definitive as that in Istanbul, the dice game. The best you can do is know that you're going to get a tile if you roll some money and then spend it, mm -hmm. or that you're going to get some extra money at the beginning of every turn. There's nothing so much as like, oh, I would like to make this a ring so that I have three rings. And that did feel a little bit just like, oh, well, I hope I get it. <laughs> I'm glad that you brought that up because... I really did enjoy it when it worked, but I definitely know that there were times in some of our games, and this game almost made it to a, to a six-pack just because it was so quick and easy to play. We got five plays of this in, in, you know, in a few days here. True. But there was a number of times in all of those games where I'm looking at the tile rack of the six different tiles there. I'm just like, I don't really want any of these things. I hope somebody else buys it. Or you're looking at it, and four of them need three yellows. So if I'm not stocking up on powers that get me either additional yellow tokens or get me yellow when I... Uh, you know, use some coin dice or something like that, it's very easy for you to get to a point where that particular part of the board is very stagnant until somebody else gets it moving. I'm a little frustrated that there's no particular way to flush that out. I dug through the rule book. It's not a very big, it's like a four page rule book, and there's nothing in there that I saw anywhere that would last say, like, oh, spend four dollars to clear the entire row. Something like that would have been nice because, it's, again, it's an opportunity to use the other things you've been collecting to mitigate some of that luck. That is likely why you get that ruby for buying buying five of those tokens right away without having to spend anything mm -hmm. on it to encourage people to buy a bunch of those tokens and keep that row from stagnating. But again, it is very much up to what you roll and what combinations work best for you. That row may sit without moving for a couple of rounds. Mm. From a downtime perspective, I think that this game is easy to teach because of the way it works, but can be a little bit wearisome to play because when you roll your dice... Unless you flip a card, you essentially are not doing anything else on anybody else's turn. Yeah. If they flip a card and you get a good, they can be like, oh, everybody take a rice, and then you take a rice and you're done. <laughs> but other than that, if I take my turn, then you take your turn, then Daniel takes his turn. After my turn is done, I can tune out for five minutes. That's yeah. fine. 
because of that, it is easy to teach because you can say, okay, roll these dice. Here's what you can do with the combinations you have. Here's how it goes to the player aid sheet. I will say the player aid sheet is very good. Yeah, it's a nice little it, sheet. You gave me the player aid sheet and went, what do you think you do with this? And then I went down the thing. I was like, oh, you do this and that <laughs> makes this and you do this and that makes that. It, it is a very easy game to teach. And that is probably one of its greatest benefits. Like I could see pulling this out because with the number of rule books we read and the number of games that we try to teach to people, this is one that I'm always going to be able to be like, pull it off the shelf. I can teach this to you in five minutes. I'm not going to forget some weird rule that comes out. Like I'm going to be able to teach this. It's easy. You roll the dice. Here's what you do. Now the next player can go around. But after I've played it a couple of times, there is definitely some downtime, yeah. specifically with higher player counts. I would say two or three for this game. Yeah, I can't, I can't recommend it at four just because you're you're doing nothing for a while. And again, you're not changing anything in terms of the tile setup. So that stagnancy of tile, or just the fact that tiles you want are going to be gone so much quicker when it comes back around to you. Uh, the one thing that does change in player count is the number of rubies that are out on the board. You get more rubies, obviously, the higher the player count is, and you have more spaces on the board when you go to four players, it flips over to the back. But, I mean, that's just, that's minor scaling. But, yeah, we played this at two and three players, and it was a quick 20, 25 minutes every time, and that might be a good spot for it. This game is, it's like, we have games that I have games that I really, really enjoy, and I have games that I don't like at all. But in the middle there, there's this collection of games that are like, I'm okay, I'm glad I have this. I could see myself bringing this to game nights because it is easy to teach and it's fun to play, you know, and it plays quickly enough. This is kind of fitting in that space of just like, I don't love it, but I'm fine with it kind of game. Yeah, this is a game I would throw in a game night bag, but I'm not sure I'd pull off my shelf if we were having a game night at home with our normal group, group of gamers who plays games all the time and who can handle something a little bit more complicated mm -hmm. but for game night it's great it's great if you've got new gamers it's it's a fine game and actually i like it better than istanbul but that's just a personal <laughs> preference issue <laughs> yeah i think that if you want a dice game in your collection as well and you want a dice game that plays quickly and you do get that kind of light engine building and kind of light goods management this is a good choice it's the goodest choice is probably 10 or 15 other games but if this one particularly appeals to you istanbul the dice game might be the one that you want Cool? Cool. All right, time for a break. We're going to come back with the big feature. We've got Most Wanted. Over the past year, we, with the help of Gunner the Viking Leader, have talked to you about tons of great games from Grey Fox Games. From expansions to Champions of Midgard and Deception Murder in Hong Kong, to new releases like Harvest Dice, Bushido, Rising 5, Multi-Universum, and Pocket Mars and even a new reloaded edition of Run, Fight, or Die. Gray Fox Games has been bringing you fantastic experiences to share with your friends and family. We look forward to another year of sharing what Gray Fox Games is up to with you, including the upcoming City of Gears and Reavers of Midgard, and tons more. Check it out for yourself and sign up for their newsletter at grayfoxgames.com. Gray Fox Games, quality games, cleverly crafted. Okay, for our six-pack review today, we have Most Wanted. This is a 2018 release from North Star Games that plays two to eight players in 15 to 35 minutes. This is designed by Ken Gruel, Quentin Weir, and Dominic Krapuschet, with art by Andy Berry, Ben Goldman, and Naomi Stanton Gulak. Most Wanted is a poker-based action selection and bank robbery Wild West game. Uh, we did also receive this as a review copy from North Star Games, so take that into account. In Most Wanted, you are an outlaw trying to become the most wanted character in the whole West, and you're doing that by committing robberies and having shootouts and duels with some occasional mitigating factors to get the resources you need to do in order to do that. At the beginning of the game, each character is going to receive a hand of cards, which is going to be like a standard deck of cards, except that it starts at six and goes through ace. You don't have any of your twos through fives in the deck. And it is a double deck of those particular numbers. So there's a whole bunch of sixes and, you know, et cetera, going on up. On your turn, you are going to go to one of the locations which is on the board. In the base setup, there are three locations that you can rob. The Pony Express, which requires a two-card hand. The Stagecoach, which requires a three-card hand. And the Train, which requires a four-card hand. If you choose to go to one of those robbery locations, you're going to take the hand size that is required by the location that you have selected, and you're going to place it in front of you. All the other players are going to decide whether they'd like to join you in that robbery and try to compete to be the winner of the robbery, because robberies have winners. <laughs> you are then, everybody who decides to stay in 
the robbery is going to flip their cards over and whoever has the best hand as determined by the hands which are applicable and are on the player aid so you don't need to know poker in order to be able to play this game to start with whoever has the best hand is going to win the points for that robbery and they're going to move their character up on a central board which indicates how wanted each character is by the law not just in general (laughs) all other players who did not win that robbery are going to need to pay their level of bail in money tokens. Money tokens can be gotten at a different location I'll get to in a minute. But as you get closer to the most wanted position, the end of that track, your bail amount is going to go up. So if you are the loser of a robbery in the first hand, you're probably starting off of the board and there's no penalty. But if you are just maybe one or two steps away from winning, you're going to have to pay three money. Otherwise, you're going to move back down that track farther away from winning the game. Now, I mentioned money tokens, and in the base game, the way you would do that is by doing honest labor. You would discard a set of suited cards, and then you would get money. There are also some locations which allow you to draw additional cards above your normal five-card hand, because at the end of your turn, you're always going to draw back up to five cards, so that you have cards in order to make different hands on other people's turns if you'd like to go in on their actions. But some of the actions you can take allow you to draw above five cards. There is a church, which allows you to draw up to seven cards. And there are some other locations which allow you to discard cards and then draw up to eight later in the game. This allows you to have a little bit more flexibility. But if you discard some of those cards, say you go to a two card hand after that, you wouldn't be able to draw more cards up. Each player is going to take their turn selecting a location and everybody else is going to have options to go in on their action unless it is one of the resource actions so like if if jake goes to the church i don't get to go on in on that but if he goes on a robbery or he challenges me to a duel i would be playing on his turn whoever manages to accrue the most points and get all the way up that most wanted track is going to be the most wanted outlaw in the entire old west and they will win the game because that's how you win when i was talking with bruce with north star games about this at gen con we were just kind of talking about the games that they had the quote that he kind of came back to again with most wanted was with most wanted they wanted to do for poker what king of tokyo did for yahtzee take that base mechanic of you're going to you know make a card hand and do some kind of you know dominance and cards thing and then add this (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> add more actions and more decisions onto that. And I think that that makes a lot of sense. That's a really good co- comparison for that because you are still doing things on that basis of poker hands where you're trying to, you know, your aces are high or maybe you want two pair or three of a kind is going to be whatever wins at that particular robbery setup or you're going to be trying to get the best cards. But it also adds a little bit of flair with the different kind of actions. The other fun little flair they throw in there is that if somebody is winning a hand with all aces, you know, like, like a two card hand with two aces, if somebody plays a uh, two sixes, They've done a six shooter and they double cross them and then that six pair of sixes wins. That's a fun little twist as well. So there's a lot of little additions to the basic poker formula in Most Wanted that are pretty fun. Yeah, this is a similar, I mean, it is not functionally similar, but it is a similar sort of idea as Arboretum has, if you've Mm -hmm. ever played that, where the highest value can be beaten by the lowest value. So Mm -hmm. you never really want to just throw in the highest value. You have to think about whether or not you think the other player may have that low value that beats, or maybe you want to mix in your high value. Maybe you get a pair of aces and a pair of kings because then the kings are still going to break up that hand. It's not all aces, so sixes wouldn't beat it if you had a four-card hand. Yeah, and that little one little area of bluff came up a whole lot. Like, that was the pretty much the main bluffing thing that happened as we were playing games of Most Wanted, where maybe I would duel somebody and they knew I had an ace in my hand, so they start pulling their card out and they think it's a six and I also played a six because I thought that they would do that and I wanted to tie but I just wanted to you know kind of draw it out a little bit more and we would have then you goes to a second duel where you have to draw another card so on and so forth and I just really was surprised how much that one little rule made some of these duels a lot more exciting and a lot more fun because like I said you know if you know somebody's got a really stacked hand you still have an opportunity to take out their ace and that's pretty cool. There is another sort of catch-up mechanic in the game that only becomes a catch-up mechanic as you get farther along in the game. The duel action spot in particular, when you duel somebody, 
they have to pay their bail if they lose, but you get the number of points equal to what their bail level is, which means that if somebody is really close to finishing the game, you're going to want to duel them because you'll get a whole bunch of points. And if a bunch of players in repetition are able to win a duel against them, which is likely because if I'm going to duel them, maybe they play their best card on the duel against me. If I can manage to beat that, if I know what's up, now they don't have that card. They're going to draw randomly, and they're probably not going to draw mm -hmm. a, a, something that fits in with their hand. It's likely that they're going to just draw a random card. And then if a couple of players can duel them, they're going to run out of money tokens and start losing points, and everybody else is going to be getting that high level of points until they move farther back down, and it allows you to sort of come back into a game where you may have been way behind. You can pull that leader back and move forward, but it only works to the point where everybody's equal. You're never going to be able to, like, absolutely destroy somebody's game because once you get them farther back down the track, now you're not getting as many points from dueling them. And eventually they're going to draw something that's really useful and start to be able to win duels again. Another thing that makes the duel action a really good catch-up mechanic is that if you're targeted by the duel, you're required to participate in it. With other robbery cards, the stagecoach, you know, the bank, and so on and so forth, you are you have the option whether or not you're going to participate in somebody else's robbery. So you can take your kind of call your shots and like, you know what, I've got a really good three of a kind. I'm going to go in on that stagecoach and I can probably win that. Well, with a duel, it's really, like you said, an opportunity to get that person who's way ahead and get some of those good cards out of their hand so that other players are able to catch up. It becomes really putting a target on their back, which is kind of what you expected in a game about being most wanted. Yeah, but if somebody is trying to do a robbery, you may not necessarily think you have the perfect hand for it, but if nobody else goes in on that robbery, mm -hmm. they're going to get those points automatically. So there definitely comes a point where even if you don't think you have the perfect set of cards, maybe you're going to use that robbery to turn over some of the cards <laughs> in your hand that are just absolutely not good and hope that they were also bluffing because they are able to switch their cards out at the end of the decision-making phase, mm -hmm. like when they say they're going to start a robbery, they put cards down and everybody else can then say, oh, okay, I'm going to go in on that. I'm going to go in on that. And maybe you get back to the beginning and that first player is like, oh, I had a bunch of junk in my hand and they, they can trade <laughs> out their cards if they want. But if they were just bluffing, hoping that nobody else went in on their train robbery, thinking nobody else had a four card combination that was going to be good they're going to lose whatever they put down and they're going to have to pay their bail money and you may be able to get a whole bunch of points. But you got to make sure that somebody's in there challenging them. One thing I will say about that, you know, we say you have the opportunity if you are the one leading the robbery to change your cards out, but I don't think I ever actually saw that happen maybe more than once in the, you know, however many nine and seven games we've played of this. I've seen it at least once where somebody okay. was trying to ditch a bunch of not great cards that did not work in their certain combination, like they had just gone to the church and drawn up a bunch of cards and yeah. they were just trying to discard some of those bad cards to just clear their hand out because you have to use the, I mean, you're going to use the card somewhere probably. Mm -hmm. And then when it came back around to them, they're like, Oh, I actually do have something better, but I was trying to keep those to get in on a future robbery because then I'd still have my good combination mm -hmm. of cards. And then they switched it out because they had enough cards. Yeah. I'd like to see more, encouragement to bluff, I think. Like, if there was more of a re reward for pulling off a, su a successful bluff, that would be a nice little touch. Just to double back around real quick to talk about the production of this game, because I really like the art. There are two styles of art in this game. There is the art for the characters, which are the standees and the box art and you know, anything that is on your player board for your personal character. But there's also a different set of art that is on the cards because the cards have face cards like any deck mm -hmm. of cards would. And the suits in the deck of cards have different themes to them. And they've got really fun, whimsical artwork on all those face cards. So your jacks and your queens and your kings are all really neat looking. And particularly the green king is the one I'm thinking of. Just yeah. has a fun, <laughs> like it's, it's this old dude. And it, it, is, it is a very fun artwork. And I appreciate that both of the art styles go together well. They're both very cartoony, but they are certainly distinct from each other. I feel like my explanation of the art in this game is kind of like a joyfully whimsical view of the old west it's very colorful it's so so colorful and everything kind of has that you know piece of paper tacked onto a wooden board kind of look to it and then those face cards like you said have that just super great uh, look and color especially those face cards so luxurious and colorful it's so much fun and the 
And the game itself, you know, all of the characters have cardboard standees, which are very nice because you move them up the track. And when you have a higher player account game, you've got this kind of like mob of outlaws walking up your table and it just looks really funny. They do a very good job with the action cards as well. They're kind of oversized tarot cards. They're pretty clear once you understand the symbology of the game. And the the bags of money are just simple punch board tokens, which is nice. And the game also comes with a pretty nice insert as well to store pretty much everything in there. You know, it's got an indent for all of the character standees, for all of your cards, for all of your uh, money tokens, so on and so forth. Some of the characters are kind of interesting sort of puns as well. Mm -hmm. For instance, there is a a sister, uh, a nun yeah. who is nun chuck sister chuck yeah. she, she has <laughs> nun chucks and i i think that's a fun there's a couple of other characters that have similar puns to that mm -hmm. and they really had a fun time creating this little rendition of the old west that you were playing in nobody's dying of dysentery here we're all just making fun little word jokes yeah so I want to kind of tell a story about the first game of this we played to kind of explain the way that my thinking of this game has evolved over time. This first game we played, we played with, I think, five. And it was good. You know, we were going pretty well. I think one or two people kind of got out in the lead. And I somehow made an opportunity that I kind of just made this good comeback. And the game came down to, I think I was dueling you. And we had, a you know, the, the, two, the one card duel. And I think we both flipped up an ace. And then I just kind of like, all right, let's have some fun with this. So I started just shuffling my cards at random. I, of course, knew that I had three queens or three kings and a, like a seven or something like that in my hand. And you didn't really know. Um, you had to flip up. You flipped up a queen. And I just kind of randomly drew one of my cards. And it was a king. And it felt really cool. Like it felt like the fun that you want from a Wild West style game. And I just really enjoyed that moment. And by the end of that game, it was only maybe 20 or minutes, we went from, oh, this is kind of like poker, but I don't get to do any of the cool things, to, wow, that was a really fun, wild moment that just happened. So much so that, you know, I was starting to put it back in the box, and I'm looking at the insert, and I'm looking at, you know, looking at the rulebook, kind of flipping through, just because I want to get more of the flavor of it. And at the very back of the rulebook, at the bottom, there's a little comment about how uh, there are stories told of greater treasures to be found out west, because this game particularly takes place in St. Louis, the gateway to the west, and the whole Wild West movement from there on, there, you know, so on and so forth. So I kind of looking at it, and I'm flipping the box over and kind of looking around, and I hear something, and my time stories instincts kick in, and I take the insert out of the box and underneath the insert is an entire additional book and more action cards. So if you have had a copy of Most Wanted on your shelf and you've played it a few times I've only played the base game, I'm sorry I've spoiled this for you, but this is so freaking awesome that there is more content underneath the box. So surprise, we've got even more to this review to talk about now. The base game that you get on the top part of this box is just sort of like the basic game. I feel like the expansion content adds so much. Yeah, so if you don't want to be spoiled by what's awaiting you underneath the box, you can skip ahead 5-10 minutes, but it's not the biggest spoiler in the world. And frankly, listening to this stuff might encourage you to play this game even more. And that's kind of what I want to do here because... Oh boy, did I really enjoy the additional stuff in Most Wanted. Oh yeah. So in the book that comes underneath, it's a travel guide. And what is legend, or, you know, the legend is, is that this particular travel guide is going to lead you to untold riches as you go further and further west. And it's actually split up into two different sections. There's the Las Vegas trip, and then there's also a Santa Fe trip. And each of these give you different card setups for the different action cards. And the Las Vegas trip is the short one. It's the original St. Louis setup, and then there's two additional cities of Denver and Las Vegas. And then the Santa Fe trail, that's one that's a little bit longer, actually has, I think, four additional stops after St. Louis. You have Independence, Missouri, Dodge City, Santa Fe, and Tombstone, because you can't do a Wild West thing without doing some Wyatt Earp stuff, right? But all of these are going to bring in these additional new exciting action cards that will either replace or become additions to the actions that you already had. For example, uh, you might have a bank robbery, which is going to be a five-card hand, and it'll teach you how to use full poker hands. The back of the book here actually has all poker rankings all the way from your high card up to your full house, your four of a kind, and your straight flush becoming things that you are actually using. Can't you also get a five of a kind in you this can, game? You can also get a five of a kind. You have the double deck, so it makes sense, kind of. And, like, the five of a kind is the most Western trope thing that I can think of, just because it's such a ridiculous thing to ever have in a hand of cards. That'll get you shot. Yes, the ace of shovels. Uh, so you also have some other things, like the church 
uh, is replaced by Pay Respects, where you can discard a straight, or you play a straight of two or more cards face up, and everybody can challenge, say, I've got a better straight in my hand, and whoever actually has the best straight is going to be able to draw up to nine cards. There's a few other ones where you're going to use the bags of money in new interesting ways. There's a general store that you can flip over some cards and then buy the cards for one coin each. There's a push your luck mechanic where you can start flipping cards, and if you hit a spade card, you bust, you take one card into hand, and if you didn't bust and you stopped taking cards, then you get two, I think one or two coins per card that you flipped up. But there's all these additional action cards that work together in really interesting ways as you go across these trails. And the trails teach you to how to kind of work them in as you go. One of the really interesting locations that's added later in the game is the Shantytown, which allows you to say, I think I have the worst full hand at the table. And I think this really added an interesting mechanic to the game because there were definitely points where I was just drawing garbage. I was drawing like six, eight, nine, ten, which when you're not playing the advanced setups, straights don't get you anything in the base setup. Neither do flushes. And I was I was drawing sort of mix and match of varying colors, and I'm like, this is not useful. But in the shanty town, you can be like, I have the worst, and if you do actually have the worst, then you are going to get points for it, and you've shown your cards, so you get a whole new hand of cards, which mm-hmm. are hopefully better. Hopefully. One of the additional action cards added in, the hired gun, I thought was really interesting. This one is thought of as a free action in that you take it, and then you get to immediately take another action. And this one also allows you to kind of mess with the other player's cards in an interesting way. You spend some bags of money, you t- give two bags of money to another player, and they must give you three cards out of their hand that you add to yours. They draw back up, but now you're sitting there with eight cards, and then you get to immediately take another action. So if I know that you are set up to do like a really good bank robbery on your turn, I can spend my two bucks and force you to give me three of your cards. And maybe, you know, they're not great cards, but it took out like that vital piece that you needed of a straight or something. And now I've got a whole bunch of stuff here that may or may not be good. It's interesting ways to manipulate the cards and manipulate the odds that in the base game, you're going to get frustrated by after a few, a few games of it. And if I gave you some cards that were really crucial to my hand and I draw back up and they are not replaced with anything that's useful, I can go to the shantytown on the next turn. And I think almost all of the setups that have the hired gun also have the shantytown. I think so, yeah. So I can go to the shantytown and be like, well, now I have nothing. And I still have options, even though you took my cards. And you're probably set up to do a pretty good robbery because you've got so many cards, you've got to have something in your hand. So... Another layer of interest on this is that we really haven't discussed is that all of these action cards are double-sided. Now, in the base game, it's not super important. The backsides of the cards on the robberies, they increase the payout and increase the risk, which is nice because as the as you go through the game, every time you shuffle the deck, you flip over one of those. So it encourages you to kind of continue going for these robberies to c- cycle the deck through so you're getting more points. But the base cards also have backsides that are kind of like nighttime versions in a way, like the honest labor card you talked about becomes dishonest labor. And this is all stuff you know in the base. In the additional content in this game, you have a bunch of new things, and some of them are, you know, different on the front and the back in interesting ways. And then they tie it all together. In the tombstone setup of this one, they actually tell you that every time you finish through the basic poker card deck and you're flipping cards, you actually flip all of the cards and you do a quote-unquote nighttime version of the game. And then you cycle back to day again, obviously on the next shuffle and the night and the day, if you get that far. Uh, Generally, we'll get maybe two, maybe three times through the deck in a particular game. Obviously, higher player counts are going to go through that deck a lot faster. Obviously. But I just love the fact that they took this foundation that after the first game, I'm like, okay, that was fun. And I don't, you know, like, okay, I'm glad we have this. I'm glad we're playing this. But once I discovered this additional content, and even we played through the the entire Tombstone San, or the Tombstone and Santa Fe Trail, we played through the entire thing in a row. And it was a lot of dang fun. <laughs> yeah, I remember when we first opened the box, there is that player card that tells you the ranking of hands. And I remember thinking, and everybody I know that played any poker said the same thing when they looked at that ranking of hands. Why are there no straights or flushes anywhere on this ranking? And it felt like an oversight, and it felt a little weird at first. It's like, oh, well, I've got all these numbers which make a straight, and if I were actually playing poker, this would be good. But as you get that additional content, you can use those things at a bank robbery or at, you know, one one of the other more advanced action cards. And I really enjoyed the fact that it really felt like a full game once you added that expansion content. 
I'm not entirely sure I would play it at the base level if mm-hmm. I were to play it again. I'm not sure which of the setups I would play. That would depend on the level of the players that I was playing with, how many people I had. But I know I would play one of the advanced setups. I don't think I would play that base setup. And if I got this game and hadn't found Mm -hmm. that additional content, it might get played a couple of times and then sit on my shelf. As it is, I keep wanting to play this game. Yeah. Like, every time we're sitting there at one of our meetups or at a game night and there's more than four people, which is, I think, where this is really going to be helpful to a lot of people. This is a five-player game, and you're fine. Mm-hmm. Like, I, you ask what I want to play, I'm like, oh, let's pull out Most Wanted again. Let's, yeah. let's get that going, and it's a fun time. I feel also that if you are working in this expansion content and you're working through one of the routes, it's going to be a really easy game to steamroll into playing more games as well, because each game is going to take you 20 minutes or so. But it got to the point where, you know, when we were getting through the the last bit of the content here for talking about it for a review, we thought, we thought, okay, we'll sit down and play three games. And we ended up playing six that day just because it was so easy to keep going like, oh, I want to see what this card does and I want to see what this one does. Another thing that I really appreciate about this particular travel book that's in here, there's a few pages after Tombstone that kind of talk about the way that they made the cards to interact. In fact, there's one page on here that gives you a website to go to to submit your city ideas so that you can say, oh, wow, I found this combination of cards that's really interesting and I want you know to share, share this with everybody. The, I love that that's in there. And then there's a, maybe four or five bullet points here about things that did or did not go well in terms of game setup when they were testing it. Like they say, any kind of robbery that also gives you bags of money ruins and breaks the game. And I just love the fact that they've got a page in here telling you how to have more fun with the game beyond what they even created. That's super cool. Yeah, it's not saying you have to create your own stuff, but if you've played through those, what, eight different setups that they Mm -hmm. originally give you a bunch of times, then you can mix and match if you want. And if it turns out not to be the best combination, you wasted 20 minutes. So the last thing I really want to talk about with Most Wanted, and I feel like this is good because we're going to come back to this discussion later on, is how it works at different player counts. This is a game that plays two to eight, and that is a wide, wide range of players. For the most part, when we were playing this at our game groups, we were playing in that kind of five to seven, maybe I think we had one eight player game kind of feel because we wanted to really kind of stress test it and see what it felt like like that. Those higher player counts felt fun. It was exactly what you expected it to be. You have a lot of interaction and a lot of people going in and out of robberies, and they all happen pretty quickly. And sure, you know, somebody might have won in, you know, a few turns faster than we would have wanted, but it's, again, quick and easy to play as soon as you want. What amazed me so much is how well it played at three players, which is a player count that I would not have expected a fun party-ish kind of game like this that relies on some good interaction to work. But we played, like I said, six games of it with three players, and all of it was pretty, you know, like a lot of fun. I agree. I expect this to be playable, but not great at three. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I'd want to play it with two ever. Yeah. But I, I expected three to be functional, but not great. And honestly, I thought it was equally as good as four or five, maybe even a little bit better. I wouldn't necessarily play it with eight just because there is, like, it's hard to keep that many people focused yeah. on something. And when your cards are cycling so quickly, if you are in a robbery and then you discard your hand and you're going to draw more cards up, you're always engaged. But I think with eight people, it's just like you have to be focused on who is winning what <laughs> and who has how much money. I would play this with like three to six, ideally. It doesn't have a problem at seven or eight. I'm not sure I'd want to play it at two, but like if you've got three to six people, this is something that I'm just going to be reaching for all the time, I feel like. Yeah, it played at all those player counts a heck of a lot better than I expected. Um, My only real frustrations in terms of like the rule books and stuff is that they're never really clear on how some straights are better than each other. I know we had a long conversation about, okay, well, is a two-card straight and a two-card straight flush, is that going to matter the same way? Does a three-card straight beat a two-card straight flush? And we got it eventually. You know, we kind of just worked out the way it made logical sense, but it's not clearly defined in the rule book. And for people coming in that have never played any poker or aren't prone to rules discussions in the middle of their 15- to 20-minute party game, I'm sure it could be a little bit of a stumbling block that could turn some people off. But... 
I think it's enough clarity for you to then make your own decisions. And again, 15 to 20 minutes, if that one thing was what changed the game and ruined it for you, that one game, just play it again and you're going to have a lot more fun pulling a random king out of your hand. <laughs> to wrap it up real quick, I think the biggest thing that I can say in the way that this game thematically works is that discovering that extra content under the box felt like striking gold. And for a game filled with Wild West tropes, having something in there that was an actual physical real reward for me exploring that game elevated it to another level. I've had so much fun playing the game, but I just had fun with the game existing and discovering that additional stuff about it. It just elevated that to another level to make me say, I really think y'all need to give Most Wanted a shot. And if you already had Most Wanted and you're eyeing that box right now, go ahead and pause the podcast so you can pause and check out that stuff under the insert if you haven't seen it yet. All right, well, that's Most Wanted. Time for us to take a quick break, and we're going to come back and put it on tap. For more information on the beers we chose to pair with today's game on tap, check out the show notes section at our website, draftmechanic.net. So the first beer we have for Most Wanted, which is, in case you have forgotten in the last, like, five minutes, a 2018 release from North Star Games. We have Great Basin Brewing Company's Outlaw Milk Stout. Great Basin Brewing Company is in Sparks, Nevada, and their milk stout is a 5.2% ABV, 20 IBU, English-style stout that's brewed with lactose. Mm. This is one of their flagship beers, and it is available in bottles, cans, and on draft. And they recommend that if you are going to get it on draft, maybe try it on nitro because it becomes extra creamy from not only the lactose, but also that nitrogen. Second up from Brewers Alvin in Moen, West Vlaanderen, Belgium, we have Wild West. It's a sour ale, 6% ABV, and this was brewed in collaboration with Stillwater Artisanal. It's a golden sour ale fermented with Morpheus yeast, and it was aged in oak Bordeaux red wine barrels for six to eight months. This is available in bottles and on draft. And there's also a fruited version of this one? There is. And they just changed the artwork on this. So if you're looking at bottles of this and you see two different artworks, as long as they are from those same breweries, hmm. they just, they're just they doing a label transition. So both of them are going to be the same nice, delicious, aged, golden sour. Nice. I wonder if we can get that here in the States with we uh, still water. We can. We've had it. I have? Yup. All right. <laughs> Good work, me. <laughs> Next up from Blackjack Beers in Manchester, England, we have Four of a Kind, which is an American IPA that comes in at 6.2% ABV. It's brewed with Cascade, Centennial, Chinook, and Columbus hops, what they are calling the big four hops, and it is available in bottles and on draft. Right up the street from us, Lone Rider Brewing Company in Raleigh, North Carolina has Shotgun Betty. It's a Hefeweizen at 5.8% ABV with 12 IBU. It's a wheat beer with rich banana clove nose and refreshing dry finish. This is available year-round on draft and in cans. This is one of kind of like the standard North Carolina beers that I've known since I moved down here. And it's just, I'm glad we finally got a chance to use it. We don't really do a whole lot of Western-themed games. The tie-in is that there is a character who is named Betty, and she does have a shotgun. There is also a Pistol Pete character in Mm -hmm. this game. So from Bosque Brewing Company in Albuquerque, New Mexico, we have Pistol Pete's 1888 Blonde Ale. This is 4.8% ABV and 20 IBUs. It is a pale straw-colored ale with a light malt sweetness and just enough late edition hops to add flavor and aromatic nuance. Ooh. Yeah, okay, if you're going to describe it like that. Nuance. But it has to be a good beer, because this is a beer that just, like, this past week won a bronze medal for Golden or Blonde Ale at GABF 2018, that is the Great American Beer Festival, and we are going to be talking a lot more about that in a minute. This is available year-round and in cans. Cool. We love Bosky at this house. Mm -hmm. I know that we go out there every time we go out to Albuquerque to visit your family. We are big fans of Bosky and what they're doing, so I am not surprised that they are making award-winning beer. Yeah, I am super excited to check out their new facility. They just opened a new facility on the north side of Albuquerque, kind of Corrales, Rio Rancho area, and it looks amazing. I really want to go check that out. So congrats to Bosky. And well, I think that's a great enough segue. But oh, quickly, if you do want information on those beers, you can hit up the show notes section on our website, draftmechanic.net. Click for episode 85, and Daniel will be putting all of those fabulous beers and putting links in to Or their, will I? Well, it depends on their brewery website, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, at least one of them is in transition. Mm-hmm. We have a joke around here that brewery websites are either completely useless or in transition. Yes. <laughs> one of them is in transition, but I will post you links so you can find info about those beers. Mm-hmm. All right, so... Once a year, we get a chance to talk about the Great American Beer Festival, and the 2018 edition of the festival happened just last weekend. Danielle, I have statistics. Would you like to hear them? I love statistics. On Saturday, September 22nd, GABF's 2018 
beer ceremony, award ceremony happened, and they awarded 306 medals to 280 breweries. 8,496 beers from 2,404 breweries were entered into the competition across 167 categories. There was an average of 83 beers entered per category, and I'll talk a little bit about which ones were the biggest ones uh, in just a second here. One of them is not a surprise because it's the one that's always been there. Mm -hmm. There were five new categories this year, actually. We had Juicy or Hazy IPA, Juicy or Hazy Pale Ale, Juicy or Hazy Double IPA. Do you see a trend? I do. The American Style Pilsner and also Australian Style Pale Ale. I like that that's got its own category now. There's a lot of really cool Australian hops and New Zealand hops, so to see them get their own category is pretty cool. I have a feeling that adding that category has less to do with the fact that there are more beers in that style and just more to do with the fact that there's improved distribution of those beers oh, yeah. over here. Very true. So, the most entered category at GABF since the year 2002 has been American Style IPA. It had 408 entries last year. However, this year... Somebody else has taken on that throne. And amazingly enough, it's one of those new categories. Once I say these words, it will not be a surprise that the new biggest category is Juicy or Hazy IPA. Yes, it's split off and 391 entries into this completely new category was the most entered category. Your classic American style IPA had 311 entries, so a drop of 100 from last year. But, I mean, if you combine these two things, that's 700 beers entered in just IPA and Juicy IPA category versus the 408 last year. One thing I do want to point out, they call it Juicy or Hazy IPA. If you ever heard us describe anything as a New England IPA, mm -hmm. that's going to fit right into this category. Yeah. And then after that, we had the American Style IPA at second. Our third was Wood and Barrel Aged Strong Stout, 177 entries, 170 people for American Style Pale Ale, and 162 for Wood and Barrel Aged Strong Beer. Interesting there also is that the uh, double IPA category is nowhere in the top five, which it used to be one of the top five in the past. Mm -hmm. I'm super excited for North Carolina right now, the state in which we reside. They brought home 13 medals this year, which is pretty darn good. It's definitely, you know, a higher representation we've had in previous years. And among that is six gold medals, four silvers, and three bronzes. I'm actually drinking one of the golds right now, uh, Noda Brewing's Gorgeous, which is their pumpkin and squash beer, pulled a, a gold in that category. We absolutely love the folks over at Noda Brewing and could not be happier mm -hmm. for them. Yeah, they pulled a silver, uh, I mean, seven years ago for um, the Coco Loco at GABF, but haven't really had a chance to bring home a lot of medals up until now. And just getting a gold for Gorgeous, the, love seeing this being so well represented in that category. I think the other interesting thing is that the pumpkin or squash beer is a category that they have definitely not awarded a gold mm -hmm. in, at least once that I can think of, because the way the rankings work for GABF is that they have sort of categories that a beer needs to be in to receive a gold silver or bronze medal like a gold medal winning beer has to be a world-class beer that is a strong representation of the style across the board and if they don't think that anybody submitted that mm -hmm. they just don't give a gold yeah. and there are definitely almost every other year i can think of there's been a category that has missed a medal mm -hmm. and to have them win gold in this category that is at least once the category that didn't get a gold that i can think of is pretty cool I don't think we had a category this year that didn't get awarded all three. I, I looked didn't at, see one. Yeah, I looked at the list as closely as I can. And if you really want to go up on the GABF website, you can print out a three-page PDF that lists all 300-plus medals in there very, will be a link. very tiny fonts. Um, but some other goals we've got in the state here. Crank Arm up in Raleigh-Durham for their White Wall Wheat. It's an American Belgian-style ale. Uh, Appalachian Mountain Brewing's Lager for American-style lager. Bearwater's Brewing Company, who I have not heard of before, or their Pink Passion Fruit Sour for Fruited American American style sour, wooden robot here in Charlotte, one for the Reserve Doré de Peche, which is a fruited and wood barrel sour beer. And very good. Mm -hmm. And uh, Little Brother Brewing, another one, I think they're Greensboro, uh, Civil mm -hmm. Rest, South German style Hefeweizen. We had silver medals from Brown Truck Brewing for American Belgo style, so the top two American Belgo style <laughs> ales were from North Carolina. That's awesome. Uh, Hillman Beer up in Asheville got uh, silver for extra special bitter. Divine Barrel, which is also in Charlotte, won a silver for historical beer. And Carolina Brewery won a silver for ordinary or special bitter. Bronzes we also got for Triple C, which is, again, a Charlotte brewery. One for English-style summer ale for their Zest Appeal. Mm -hmm. D9, another Charlotte area brewery, actually one of our closest breweries. Mm -hmm. One for Brewer's Day Off, which is a cucumber goza, which is so good. I love that beer. And a bronze for Little City Brewing Company and Session IPA. I feel kind of weird that this is the first time we're saying Session IPA in this rundown. Usually we mm -hmm. were talking about that a lot, but I have a feeling 
that a lot of the people who were sort of dabbling in session IPAs may now be <laughs> submitting those juicy or hazy IPAs that we got so many of. Mm-hmm. One last, uh, st- I want to say standard production beer that I want to call out is that Cane Brewing up in Ocean, New mm. Jersey won a silver and wooden barrel aged strong stout for their A Night to End All Dawns, which I know is a beer that we are both super fond of. Mm-hmm. But since we talked about homebrewers earlier in this episode, I wanted to call out the people who won the Pro-Am competition. Oh, awesome. Because JBF has a Pro-Am competition. There were 101 entries, and the way it works is that you have to have a brewery that you are submitting the beer with. You can't just be like, I made a beer in my garage. <laughs> yeah, I brought you this I'm going to send it to Denver. Uh, no, you have a Pro-Am competition. There is a brewery, then there is a their brewmaster, and then the American Homebrew Association member who submits mm-hmm. the beer along with it. So the gold medal, the gold medal went to Deer Crossing, which was brewed with Little Harpeth Brewing Company in Nashville, Tennessee. The brewmaster was Jesse Brown, and the AHA member, American Homebrew Association, was Chris Allen. The silver went to Gone for a Burton. This is from the Rock Bottom Brewery in Warrenville. The location is listed as Denver because Rock Bottom has a ton of locations. Mm-hmm. The brewmaster was Eric Pizer, and the AHA member was Jim Todd. And the bronze went to La Bomba from Chaluna Brewing Company in Aurora, Colorado. The brewmaster is Jennifer Perez, and the AHA member is Chris Cardillo. Cool. So I wanted to call those folks out because we already talked about homebrewing once. We should talk about it again. <laughs> I am down with that. Well, congratulations to everybody out there who won some medals at GABF this year. Uh, again, super congratulations to our friends at Noda Brewing. Gorgeous is such a great beer, and I'm really excited to see them get recognized for it. But, Danielle, you'll put some information about all that stuff in the show notes so you can poke around and find the uh, award-winning beers in our listeners' areas. Will do. Cool. All right, time to take a quick break, and we'll be right back with the final round. Want a second opinion on some of the games we talked about on this episode? Check out some other great content creators at punchboardmedia.com. Alrighty, it's time for the final round. In the final round, we pose a question to our Slack channel, and everybody shares their responses. If you want to join us, draftmechanic.net slash Slack. You can join our Slack channel for free and talk about board games and beer and all those things right there. But today's topic is, we were surprised at how well Most Wanted, two to eight players, plays at three players. What's a game you think either works really well at all counts or is outright lying about its player count. Um, I'll start out with Eric Buscemi, who kind of laid some good ground rules for a lot of this discussion in general. Two things immediately spring to mind, he says. One, anything that needs a dummy player to play at two does not play at two. And two, Summoner Wars is a two-player game, not a two- or four-player game. I think by extension, that also means Ashes is a two-player game. Yeah, I think we're going to hear a lot of things that are two-player games, Mm -hmm. not four-player games. (laughs) Megan Naxer said... As a gamer who primarily plays at two, this could be a very, very long list. As for a couple of standouts, Star Wars Rebellion and War of the Ring are two-player games, not four. John Tyler says, So many games I will not play at max player count. Terraforming Mars, Champions of Midgard, Agricola, Space Base is another I won't play at five. This is pretty often what I hear. You know, we talked about this with some of our games, I think, in the last few weeks. Space Base particularly. Yeah, exactly. You know, these, they say five players. They extend it to five players just to, like, oh, yeah, this totally plays five players by our game. But it kind of does occasionally come back to haunt them when you play that five-player game and you sit there for 80% of the game doing nothing. Uh, Tamara from our local game group said, It's a simple light game, but I do like how the dummy player in Takaido works. I haven't had a chance to try any others with that mechanic, though. What was that one new word game we recently played with five players where we ran out of money and cards? It was Spell Smashers. Definitely should have kept that at four players. Hopefully the pieces are okay at that count. I will take a little bit of heat for that. When I initially taught this, I didn't realize that you can only have maximum two quest cards, and you have to recycle after that. When we played it, we ran out of cards because people weren't completing quests, and they had like three or four quests in their hand. Either way, we ran out of money. Either way, yeah. Like, this is the kind of thing where we played it with five players, and the particular mix of things that came out left us with zero or one dollars in the general pile, and for a game that you need money to put on all of the different monsters for their health. Um, we'll talk about this game probably yeah, in the Yeah, this game comes future. out in November. Yeah. So. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it's interesting. Sometimes you see this where they bump up the player count, but don't actually have the components in the box to support it. BJ from Board Game Gumbo says, Imperial Settlers plays so much better at two or three. Four just seems to take too long. Paul Imiden said, As much as I love it at two to four players, Kalis is just a mess at five players. Battlestar Galactica at less than five is sad. Camel Up plays well at all counts, as does Downforce and Petchcar. Most racing games would fit this, I think. 
Also, Magic Maze has a solo mode, but are you <laughs> kidding? We had a fun little back and forth on this on the Slack about Magic Maze. I don't understand how that game has a solo game. Do you have like one hand can only move up and down and the other one can do left and teleporters and like you have to like slap your hand with the other hand to get it to move or something? Yeah, I mean, especially in a game where the whole point of the communication being shut down so you can't talk to other players, like what can you not talk to yourself? <laughs> D. Shannon Berry said Viticulture Essential Edition and Castles of Burgundy both stand out to me as games that shine at all counts. Flow of History, weirdly, falls apart for us at three, but is t- fine at two or four. That's an interesting one where the middle player count is the one that didn't work. Dennis said, played Flow of History as a two player and found it really clunky with all the special rules. Hard to find a multiplayer game with interaction that scales well to two. Kingsburg does a decent job with a quick roll of the dice to block some actions. Hmm. So now we've heard that Flow of History doesn't work well at two or three. We have this game and we have to (laughs) check out to see how we feel because that's just sounding like it plays at four. Well, if you listen to our last episode, BJ from Board Game Gumbo said that it was his favorite uh, game of the last few years even. Okay, so maybe he's playing it at four. Hmm. Finally, Patrick Hillier rounds us out says, number nine, Wits and Wagers, six nymphed, between two cities, all scale well. Word Slam is a great party game that allows flexibility in size, people dropping in and out, etc. I think that that's a really good space that works with a lot of players. Those big team versus team party games. You know, we always talk about code names as being something that fits that really well. Mm-hmm. Well, on a similar note to that, Decrypto, which is a game that I like to really play in opposition to code names now, it does not play at a lower player count at all. Like, it I don't also think... isn't great with an odd number of players. Yeah, very true. And that's a game that could, you know, have a good player count, or at least it's listed on the box, but only even players. And frankly, I would only ever play it at six or eight. There you go. Well, if you have any thoughts, you can throw them in the guild or you can throw them in our Slack channel. You can do all those things if you want. But uh, I think it's time for us to wind this one down. Again, hit up draftmechanic.net for all your draft mechanic needs, at draft mechanic on your favorite social medias of Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and all that goodness. Like I said, that is guild number 2470, where you can put all those thoughts if you have them. If you are in the Charlotte area, our next meetup is on October 4th. That is a Thursday, and it is at Good Road Cider Works. Draft Mechanic is sponsored by Gray Fox Games. Visit grayfoxgames.com and sign up for their newsletter for the latest. Gray Fox Games, quality games, cleverly crafted. I think that's everything. Daniel, did I forget something? As always, I would like to remind our listeners to please game responsibly and tell them that I'll see them back here in two weeks for another round. Alrighty, I'm good with that. Good night. Night. Draft Mechanic Episode 85 was recorded on Sunday, September 30th, 2018 in front of a live studio cat. stricken do not go gently into that good life hey board gamers bj from board game gumbo here back with more louisiana flavor tornado mission we love talking board games that's why we started up gumbo live the number one facebook live talk show dedicated to board gaming each week we interview guests from your hobby publishers designers content creators and you get to ask them whatever you like it's a live show so join us at board game gumbo on facebook every tuesday night at 8 30 p.m central for another episode of gumbo live and until next time les les bon temps roule punchboard media where we all bring something to the table pull up a chair at punchboardmedia.com 